I am uh, very thankful for the opportunity to come here and speak at your impressive Congress in defense of uh, public transportation. The reason I am here is uh, a book of mine. You can see the, it over there. Uh, the title in Swedish is the, the Stora Tågrånet. It, it means the, the great train robbery. It's actually, it's not about uh, the famous train robbery in Britain in the 1960s, but it's in a way, it's a criminal story. Uh, it's about the Swedish railways. Uh, the subject might seem to be of lesser importance, but I can assure you it is not. The European Union has decided to reorganize the European railways. This affects not only members of the Union, but also countries like Norway and Switzerland. The model is Sweden. Already in the late 19th century, it became evident that railway traffic needs a lot of coordination and planning to work properly. Uh, the market had ruled in the beginning, but that was in many ways a chaotic period. Soon the railways developed in new directions. Railway companies became either private or public monopolies. In the US, railways were the beginning of the modern corporation. That is a private, vertically integrated organization with a high level of coordination and planning. In Europe, public railways were more common. They introduced a measure of planned economy within the framework of private capitalism. On the railways, Sweden has now, as the first country in Europe, returned to the 19th century chaos of the market. In 1988, we started heading backwards, and no one dared to follow, not even Margaret Thatcher. Today, this is the model for Europe to implement. The wheel and the rail belong together. They constitute a unified technical system that cannot be separated without strong negative effects. But that was exactly what Sweden did in the 1980s. The parliament decided that to split the National Railways Company in two parts, one for the wheels and one for the tracks. A separate transport agency became responsible for the infrastructure, Statens Järnvägar, the National Railways, took care of the rest. But in 2001, it lost all freight traffic, all the workshops, all stations and terminals, and a lot of other remaining parts of the integrated railway system. The purpose was to open up for competition and privatization. Whoever wants to is now in principle free to compete for passengers and freight traffic on Swedish railways. The infrastructure is still publicly owned, but profit-seeking companies that tender for contracts are responsible for keeping the infrastructure in good condition. And I can assure you they do not do that. Uh, the Swedish experiment might be a model for Europe, but at home it is known as a disaster. I will give you a few examples. Uh, nowadays, it's quite common for toilets on Swedish trains to, that, are, that they are locked because of technical problems. If you are, have bad luck, you might even discover that all toilets on your train are locked because of technical problems. How is that? Firstly, the train operator does not have its own workshop anymore. Work is outsourced to independent companies who have to tender for contracts. 
the lowest price will give you the contract. To make a profit, the engineering company will tend to do as little as, pos as it possibly can of what it has to do according to the contract. Secondly, it is only rational for train companies to compete for passengers on the most profitable railway lines between Stockholm, uh, Gothenburg and Malmö, the largest cities in, in Sweden. The public sector subsidizes local, regional and non-commercially viable traffic and sell it out on offer to the lowest bidder. To win the contract and squeeze out the profit, train operators will cut down on everything that can be cut down. That is staff, supplies, cleaning and maintenance. That is why trains with defective toilets sometimes are put into traffic in Sweden. It also happens, workers tell me, that operators use locomotives and wagons with more serious errors, jeopardizing safety on the tracks. Another example. Sometimes it snows a lot in Sweden. Oh, you're laughing. It's, it's true, it's true. In the 1960s, the National Railway Agency ordered 30 heavy diesel-powered locomotives equipped specially for uh, plowing snow. Two, 2010 and 2011, we had a couple of severe winters with a lot of snow and low temperatures. Many departures were cancelled and some passengers got stuck on trains in the middle of nowhere up for up to 12 hours. Those locomotives would have been han handy then, but there were only 10 of them left. Why? Most of them had been scrapped, even though they could have been fully functional with normal maintenance and some reparations. It was even worse. A train driver told me he was out on the tracks with a colleague during one of the worst snowstorms. Suddenly, they saw one of those snow plowing trains, uh, locomotives coming towards them on the other track. But it was not doing what it was supposed to do. It was not plowing snow. It was pulling freight wagons. So the, the two train drivers, they looked at each other and they said, oh, this is too much. How can they be so stupid? But remember, this is not a question of individual mistakes. The, stupidi the, the stupidity is systematic. If the purpose of the railway system is functional, if the aim of everyone is to make trains arrive on time with good comfort and safety for the passengers, then it is rational to have 30 snow plowing locomotives standing waiting for the next snowstorm. But that is not the way it is in Sweden anymore. Our railway system is fragmented into hundreds of different companies, each one with its own yearly accounts as the sole purpose of the work. In this context, the snow plowing locomotive becomes an expense that does not pay for itself. It is better to scrap it or lease it out to a freight company. How did our politicians argue when they introduced this systematic stupidity? The railways will become more efficient, they said. The bureaucracy will decrease. What happened? I found this graph in uh, an official yearly report from the Swedish Transport Agency, the authority responsible for the tracks, for the infrastructure. Uh, we don't have to care of the light blue curve. It's uh, misleading and irrelevant in this context. The upper blue curve 
is a measure of tra traffic on the tracks from 2002 to 2009. Traffic grew, as you can see, by almost 10%. The lower dark curve shows the costs of maintaining the infrastructure. Despite increased traffic, costs declined during these years when competition uh, was introduced on the railways. Thus, the transport agency says, this reform led to a more efficient system. Sweden has increased productivity on, in track maintenance better than anyone else in Europe. But take a closer look at the dark curve. It indicates direct costs. You might wonder how the indir indirect costs developed during those years, like this. They more than doubled during those seven years. What are those indirect costs? This is what the transport agency has to say about it. Oh, this is in Swedish, I think. <laughs> well, a significant and increasing share of total assets for maintenance and reinvestments goes to indirect operating and maintenance costs, such as maintenance, management, tele telecommunications, power grids, and interaction with operators. Two of these costs, maintenance, management, and interaction with operators are increasing just because of the introduction, introduction of market mechanism and the increasing number of operators out on the tracks. So what the, this graph shows us is f the following. Fewer workers are, than before are out on the tracks doing what they can to keep the infrastructure in good con condition. At the same time, more and more white-color workers are sitting in the offices, writing contracts, checking in invoices, and trying to keep track of all the operators uh, on the tracks. The market reforms did not give us less, but more bureaucracy. Railway workers in Sweden really want to do a good job. But this systematic stupidity prevents them from doing it. Professional skills get devalued, cheating and sloppy work take over. This is also harmful for safety on the tracks. We have had s several fatalities and serious incidents lately related to the new Swedish railway model. An, exp an expert on electrical safety summarized the prevailing attitude. Safety first, they say, as long as it does not interfere with traffic. Uh, let, let me finish with a cartoon that will give you a glimpse of what will happen if you try to introduce this model in Switzerland. One guy says, didn't I tell you the drawing was upside down? And the other replies, well, it's damned easy to be wise after the event. Think it over first. That is my advice to you. Thank you.